scripture for today's sermon comes from the book of Acts. The book of Acts chapter 2. Chapter 2, starting in verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, and to the, break, to the breaking of bread, and, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. May God bless the reading of his word. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's been good to be in God's house so far, hasn't it, this morning? I'll tell you what, especially on, on a day like today, I mean, it's always good to be in God's house, but it's, there's something really, uh, really nice about coming in out of the cold, and it's not that cold out there, but coming in out of the rain and out of the nastiness and, and just coming together and being a part of, of God's people. I want to welcome you here this morning. I want to welcome you, if you uh, especially if you're here for the first time or maybe you've been coming for a few weeks. Uh, we consider you our VIPs and so I want to let you know that. Um, a couple of things that, that you can do to, uh, to help us, help you have a VIP experience. Um, on the way out, there is a, uh, there's a room, uh, our VIP room. Uh, we've got a free gift that we'd like for you to have. Uh, some information about the church. I'll be back there. We'd love to get a, love to get a chance to meet you, to get to know a little bit more about you. Um, and the other thing that you can do, if you look in the, in the seat in front of you, there's a, there's a card. If you could uh, uh, just give us a way to get in contact with you. I promise we won't blow up your inbox with like 20 emails or anything like that. But uh, um, just give us a way that we can get in contact with you. We'd like to know, let you know a little bit more about what's going on and different ways that you can get involved and get plugged in here at Bridge 42. So uh, I wanted to mention that this morning. Uh, one, because I hadn't in a few weeks, and two, because it's kind of what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about the community, the fellowship that the, that the early church had. So we've seen, as we've gone through this series this week, we're in the last week of our Everybody Lives series, and we've seen the, uh, the message that the, that the disciples had, the message that changed everything. And we've seen the, uh, the mission that they were given to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And then here at the end of Acts chapter 2, in verses 42, and, uh, 42 through 47, we get a little bit of a, a picture into the, the fellowship and the community that the, that the first century church experienced in the first weeks and months of, of, of its existence. And we get, I think, a picture of the fellowship and the community that God desires for us to experience, not just here at Bridge 42, but in, in all of his churches, all around this city, all around this country, and all around this world. And so uh, this morning, we're going to do that. We're going to look into what, it, what their fellowship, what their community looked like, and, 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 and also what our fellowship and our community ought to look like as well. And, cause, and fellowship is one of those words... I'm going to use fellowship and community interchangeably this morning because they come basically from the same Greek root word, koinonia, which means fellowship, community, common, communion, all those kinds of things. And, uh, and also because fellowship is a word that I am committing myself to, to reclaiming, to redeeming. Because so many of us have a misconception, have this kind of misconception, this kind of false idea of what fellowship is. This passage describes God's idea of fellowship. This, this describes the fellowship that the first century church had, and it's, it's very different, I think, than, than what a lot of us think of when we think of fellowship today. Um, for example, when we think of fellowship today, well, actually, let me do, let's do a little word association, all right? I'm going to say the word fellowship, and then y'all are going to, I'm going to count to three, and, one, two, and, and y'all are going to just shout out the first word that comes into your mind. I know this is church, and, and you were taught growing up probably that you weren't supposed to shout in church, but just forget all that for a second. And I'm going to say the word fellowship, and I want you to just shout out the first word that comes to your mind. So here we go. One, two, three. Fellowship. Food. I heard food. <laughs> that was the loudest thing I heard. I think I heard dinner back there. Somebody, did I hear dinner anywhere? Anybody say dinner? Okay, maybe not. All right. That was what I, I had in my blank here. Amen, brother. <laughs> 
And that's what, that's what I'm talking about because fellowship is more than food and it's more. Now, I have no problem with fellowship dinners. Let me stand to the side so y'all can get this, the clear picture that I am not against fellowship dinners. That's probably one of the first things you noticed when you first walk here, walked in here this morning. That dude is not opposed to fellowship dinners. I love fellowship dinners. But fellowship is more than dinners. It's more than food. It's more than fried chicken. Like that's what we seem to, like, when somebody says, let's have a fellowship, and the first question you hear is, who's bringing the chicken, right? I mean, I grew up in New York. Y'all, y'all have fried chicken around here for everything. I mean, I'm not, especially when somebody dies. Like, when did fried chicken and death become inextricably linked? It was probably possible. It was, it was what? It was the cause of death. <laughs> that's true, yeah. Fried chicken causes death, I think, yeah, I mean, where, uh, up north we send flowers when somebody dies. I remember the first time that, that I, I had been down here about two years and Anna's grandfather passed away and we were over at, the, uh, at her grandmother's house. We spent a few days over there and people just kept coming by bringing bucket after bucket after bucket of fried chicken. And I, I'm just, I mean, if doctors were ever able to reverse the aging process, I think KFC in North Carolina would just like totally go out of business. Okay, all right, food. That's one, the first thing, that's one of the things we think about. The, the next thing we think about, I'm going to call it chatter. Because like, conversation is, is a part of fellowship. But we, 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 especially in our day and age, we kind of like to try to keep it surface level. Like the chatter, like how's the weather and, and you know, sports and, and things. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's where friendships and deep relationships start is with those surface level conversations. You don't just walk up to somebody the first time you meet them and say, hey, my name is Jason. Tell me about your deepest hopes and fears. Like, that's not how you do it, right? You, you, you start off on that surface level, but hopefully you, you, and not with everybody, but with some people, hopefully everybody in this room, we have some people in our lives that we can, we can share the deep, you know, dark sometimes hurts and fears and hopes and dreams that we have. And so, but, but a lot of times when we're talking about fellowship, you know, we want to sit around and, and eat our food and, and talk about the weather. And, and, uh, so I think that, you know, conversation is a part of fellowship, but a lot of times we, we don't want to take it as deeply um, as I think God intends for us to do. And then the third thing I had is fun. And again, fellowship is not the opposite of fun. Fellowship should be fun, but it's, it's more than that. And I think that's the common link in all of these is that we kind of sell ourselves short when it comes to fellowship. We're content with food and fun and chatter, but God has given us the ability through the Holy Spirit to build deep, meaningful relationships that are much bigger than those things. Relationships that go much deeper and ultimately are much more satisfying even than fried chicken. So let's look at the fellowship that the early church had this morning. And, uh, and like I said, in so doing, I think we'll see a little bit about God's idea for fellowship, for the fellowship that we should have. So as we start off in verse 42, the first thing we see, number one, the foundation of true community is the gospel. Right there in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to what? To the apostles' teachings. Right? The church is not just any old community. It's not, a, it's not like a Ruritan club. It's not a service club. It's not a country club. The church is not just any old community. It is a gospel community. And we can't have the fullness of community that God intended for us apart from the gospel. It's what brings us together. And, and a lot of people in our culture today, they have this idea that, that doctrine divides. And even in the church, we hear things like this, that, that doctrine divides. And while it's true, there are people all throughout history, and there are plenty of people today that are misusing, in their human sinfulness, they are misusing doctrine to divide people and to separate people. But in reality, doctrine can be the strongest unifying force that we have. Those things that we hold in common, those things that we all believe together, that we stand on together, these are the things that, that tie us together in a deeper and more meaningful way than anything else could. It can be the greatest unifying force that we have. Let me give you an example. In the early years of the church, this is after the time of the apostles, but before the time when, when, church, when the church kind of became this worldwide institution. So we're talking about after the apostles had, had, had died, before the church became a worldwide institution, there, there developed what we now call the Apostles' Creed. And um, 
And this was used in churches throughout the Roman Empire to teach people the basics of the faith and to help them gain entrance into the community. Often they would have people memorize the creed before they were being baptized. And some, actually some denominations still do that today. <clears throat> and it was used um, to, to teach people the basics and to, to bring the community together. We come in here, we all have this same creed that we stand on, that we believe, that we, that we hold tightly to, and it, and it brings us together. And, and let me give you an example of how, how this might have worked. So let's imagine that, that I'm living in, in the early 2nd century Roman Empire, and, and I've got to go to another town for business. And this happened from time to time. And I've got to stay there maybe several weeks or a few months um, on, on some kind of a business venture. And so I'm going to be away from my family. I'm going to be away from my church uh, for several months in, in this other town. And, and it wasn't like it is today where you could, you know, where there's churches all over the place and there's big signs on the road. The, the church in these days, they were worried about persecution. The Roman Empire was, was persecuting Christians. They were being put in prison. Some were being put to death. And so, you know, they had to meet kind of secretly. And even if I were to walk up to, to one of these fellowships and, and knock on the door and, and uh, say, hey, I'm a Christian, let me in. They're going to want to know because it wasn't, it wasn't past the realm of possibility that a Roman soldier or a government official might try to gain entrance to the community in order to try to, to break them up and to persecute them and, and, and to put them in, into prison. And so I knock on the door. They're going to say, what do you believe? And I'm going to say the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. I believe in the Holy... Uh, no, he ascend, uh, He rose... I believe that he rose again from the dead. Well, I'm glad I'm not in one of those denominations because I wouldn't be able to be baptized. <laughs> um, I believe that he rose again from the dead. I believe that he ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in one holy church for the communion of saints and the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body and I believe in the life everlasting. I would say that and they would say, okay, you're one of us, come in. And so it was this great unifying force. It brought them together. It was something that they all held in common that, that unified them across geographical lines. And we don't need to necessarily have that creed or memorize it or anything like that. But these, these truths, these basic truths of the Christian faith that we understand, they unify us across geographical lines, across, across uh, denominational boundaries. We, are, we have brothers and sisters in, in China and, and in... in uh, you know, up north and, and in South America, we have brothers and sisters that, that lived 500 years ago. And if, and if, you know, if Jesus doesn't return, we'll have brothers and sisters that will live 500 years from now that we'll never meet. But they're brothers and sisters because we hold these truths in common. The ancient Israelites had a creed too. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these are the words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. These are the things that bind us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ. He rose again from the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in one holy church. These are the things that bind us together. Too often churches are bound together because they come from similar walks of life. Or they hold similar political views. Or if they're from the same race or the same socioeconomic background. Uh, you know, there's some churches even that they're, they're bound together from the fact that they're all from the same family. Right? And, and if those are the things that unify you, that's, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't take a work of God to do that. That's nice, but that's not really something, something overly special. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's fine. But, but how much more powerful is it if God can take people from different backgrounds and bind them together? Black, white, rich, poor, Democrat, Republican. It doesn't matter. How, how much more powerful is it that, that we can come together 
in spite of all the things that, that make us different because the things that bind us together, those things that we hold to are so much deeper and so much bigger and so much more glorious than the things that would try to separate us. Before we move on, I want to I want, uh, just speak one word of caution really quickly uh, that if you'll notice, these creeds are not very long. The Apostles' Creed was not particularly long. Um, you know, the, the one that the ancient Israelites had was, was very short. And, and I just want to, you know, to, to, to point that out to you because there are certain things that we must hold as Christians that are, that are non-negotiable. They're closed-handed issues. We hold tightly to them with a closed hand. You know, the God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, sinless Son of Man, sinless Son of God, the Holy Spirit, you know, the resurrection of the body, the, the life everlasting. These are the things that we hold tightly to a closed hand, with a closed hand. There are other places where we should be tolerant of other points of view with, within the bounds of Scripture. There are other issues that might be open a little bit more to, to interpretation. You know, a couple of examples, the, the rapture is a good example of that. There are good, godly men and women who love Jesus and who know more about the Bible than I do that have different interpretations of exactly how the end times are going to play out. And so, you know, we, we, we have opinions and we, and we, we might disagree, but we, we ultimately we say, you know, ultimately, I, I don't quite see eye to eye with you on that, but, but we are brothers and we are sisters in Christ and we can have unity and we can have fellowship and we can work together on those things. You know, Calvinism and Arminianism is another one. You know, we have to be willing to admit that not, we're not, none of us are exactly sure where the line between our free will and God's sovereignty lies. There are different interpretations of that. And we have to be open that, that, that Scripture um, is, is open to interpretation on those things. And we can, we can, we can have disagreements on, on those, those smaller issues, but still stand together on the great truths of God's Word that, that we believe in God the Father Almighty, that He created heaven and earth. We believe that Jesus came, that He died uh, a, a, an atoning death on the cross for us. He died in our place. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We, 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 we may disagree a little bit with, with another church here on, on how he works, but we stand together on the fact that we believe in the Holy Spirit. And these are the things that we stand on, that we hold tightly to with a closed fist, with a closed hand. They bring Because they bring us together. And they, they're so much bigger and more glorious than anything could try to separate that could, that could try to separate us. They give us life, and they bring us together. So the first thing is the 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 the, uh, the foundation of true community is the gospel. The second thing is the li the life's blood of true community is relationships. If you look at verse forty four, it said, "All who believed were all who believed were." together and they had all things in common right and this is what the church really should be about it's about real people living life together having all things in common I, I don't look I don't look at that necessarily in in their context they did because of the persecution that they were experiencing they did like bring all of their possessions and and distribute them among themselves I don't think in our day and age that's necessarily necessary um but we have all things in common in the sense that we share our lives together. We don't just share our church lives together, but we share our whole lives together. We don't, we don't just, you know, so many times, so many people, they, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of wanting to do this sometimes, where, you know, we want to get ourselves dressed up, metaphorically speaking, and kind of, you know, just make everything look good. And, you know, you know the, old, the old example where you're, you're driving to church, and you're yelling at the kids in the car, and your wife, and you're fighting, and then you walk out, and you're like, oh... This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know? and, and, and sometimes we want to do that. But it's about real life. It's about living life together. About people really loving each other. Really loving Jesus. Failing sometimes. But, but, but really loving Jesus. Disagreeing sometimes with each other. But, but really trying to love each other. Church is not about a building or a band or a preacher. It's not about getting yourself dressed up and pretending to have it all together because deep down inside we all know that none of us have it all together. Jesus is putting us back together and he's making us more like him. But we have to be open about, about who we are. And that goes both ways. You know, a lot of times preachers are guilty of, 
I'm saying you need to take your faith and take it out into the world. And that's true. But not, but not also saying, you know, you need to bring your, your regular life or whatever you want to call it and, and bring it to church with you. Don't pretend like you don't have problems. Don't pretend like you don't have struggles. Don't pretend like, like sometimes things aren't, aren't going your way. Bring your church life out into the world and impact the world around you for Jesus, but bring your regular life to, to church with you and let God work on you. Let, let people around you love you and, and build you up and encourage you. Amen. And which brings me to the next thing. If the life's blood of true community is relationships, the oxygen of true community is authenticity. In his book, Why Nobody Wants to Go to Church Anymore, Tom Schultz, he's a Christian writer. He wasn't saying that you shouldn't, should want, not want to go to church anymore. He's saying that less and less people are going to church. That's what the, the point of that book is. But he said, authenticity is like oxygen to a conversation. And I believe that's true. You can't have open, gospel-centered, relational conversation without authenticity, without being honest, any more than you can have it without oxygen. And we see this in this passage. We see this here in verse 42. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the breaking of bread. And some commentators think that that's a reference to communion. And, and it might be, but some other commentators think it's a reference to them just kind of going and sharing meals together. And I think it's probably both. I think, uh, you know, that, that, it, that it refers to both. That they broke bread in the sense of, of the communion kind of, of, of ritual that we're going to do in just a few minutes. And they also broke bread. They went around to each other's homes and they shared life together. They, they shared meals together. They were authentic and real with each other. They shared their real selves not just their church selves. You know, and too many times in this culture I ha we have a real self, we have a, a regular, ordinary, daily, uh, during the week self, and then we have a church self. I remember when I was uh, working at Rexel many years ago in Hickory in, in the warehouse. And uh, it was right after I graduated from college and <clears throat> somebody found out that I had studied to be in the ministry. And... Um, I started having these like bizarre conversations with people once it had gotten around that I had studied to be in the ministry. This one guy, I remember this one guy, I didn't even know, I don't think I even knew his name at the time. He comes up to me, he's like, hey man, I just want to let you know that, uh, you know, I've been meaning to get back into church, but it's just been hard, I mean, hard to find the time, and, and but, but I know I need to go, man, we're going to start going back into church. I'm like, dude, I don't care. I really don't. God did not send me here. I mean, on one sense, I care. I want everybody to go to church and hear the gospel and be saved. But on the other sense, I don't even know your name, dude. You know, I, I wouldn't say this, any of this stuff. But I, but I was thinking, like, why are you coming up and, and telling me this stuff? Like, God did not send me as like a secret agent to spy on you or something like that. <clears throat> but we do that. We, 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 we separate our church selves from our kind of ordinary, everyday selves. And it looks like from this passage that the early church had completely intermingled their spiritual lives and their, just for lack of a better word, their regular lives. And that's the goal. And that's what we want to happen here at Bridge 42. We want to be the place where faith and life intersect, where we don't just come and hear a bunch of teaching about some stuff that we only talk about on Sundays and then the other six days of the week we go out and do a bunch of stuff that's like totally unrelated. We don't want to do that. We don't want to get together and just do church, churchy things. We want to share our lives. We want to have conversations about faith and about doubt and about sin and about righteousness. But we also, we want to have conversations about how to figure out what's wrong with the car. Or maybe about that new recipe that you, that you tried last week. Or maybe about that, that you know, what, what can I do to help me out with that guy down the hall at work that's just driving me crazy. Because we got stuff like that going. Don't pretend somebody, don't, don't pretend you're more holy than me and somebody didn't just pop into your head when I said that guy down the hall at work that's driving you crazy. I know y'all are a bunch of sinners and, that, and that, that somebody just, somebody's face just popped into your head, right? We need to share this stuff. We need to help each other with these things. And I think that's what the, the first century church realized that the, there wasn't a different in, in difference. In a sense, all of our lives are spiritual. We can't differentiate between our church lives and our regular lives. You look at verse 44, they had everything in common. Verse 46, it said, breaking, their bread in, breaking bread in their homes. I don't think this was a program. I don't think this was like some kind of early church life group ministry or something like that. This was them doing life together, eating together, praying together, struggling together, having fun together. 
crying together, doubting together, going to the beach together, fixing the car together, doing life together, sharing their hopes and fears, sharing their home improvement tips and their recipes, talking about the game, and talking about what God's doing in their life and in their family. They had everything in common. And this brings me to the last thing, and we're going to camp out on this for just a minute. But the results of true community are unbelievable. Verse 43, it says, And awe fell upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. And a lot of people like to focus on the second half of that verse. A lot of people like to, like to focus on the many signs and wonders were being done by the apostles. And, and I just want to, I, I do believe in miracles. I do believe that God still works miracles today. And I know that not every Christian necessarily, there are some Christians that, that, you know, again, good, godly people that love Jesus, that know a lot about the Bible, that think that some of those miraculous gifts ceased, uh, you know, when the church was set up. And, and, and that doesn't mean they love Jesus less than me, and that doesn't mean I love Jesus less than them. We just don't quite see it quite the same way. But I do believe that miracles still happen today. But, but a word about miracles before we move into what I really want to talk about in this, where it says, an awe fell upon every soul, is, um, is that the greatest miracle that we can experience is the miracle that God would come and save us from our sin and put the Holy Spirit in us. That God would take a rebel heart like mine and rescue me and put his Holy Spirit in me to go through this life with me to convict me of my sin, to lead me to repentance, to lead me to righteousness. Let's never underestimate the fact that that is a miracle, that that is the greatest miracle that we could ever experience. That somebody like me who is dead in my sin can be given life and can be set on this path where I'm being made like Jesus. That's a miracle. Now, right before that, it says, and awe fell upon every soul. And I'll, I'll admit to you, I'm kind of guilty of that, of, of skipping over that to get to the miracle part sometimes. Uh, but I want to camp out on that for just a second. The Greek word here for awe is the word phobos. And some of you that are a little bit um, more like into words might, might have kind of recognized where that comes. It's the same word we get phobia from, fear. It's the same word. It's, it could be translated awe, it could be translated respect, and it could be translated fear. And so in a sense you could say, and I think the King James actually does say, it says, and fear fell upon every soul. And, and we don't talk much about fear in the life of the believer. And I'll, I'll admit to you that I'm probably as guilty as anyone else of this. I talk about fear in the sense that God, if God is for us, if we belong to God, then, then what is greater than him? What, what do we have to fear? And that's true. Man, if, if we belong to Jesus, there's nothing to fear because he is greater than anything that could come against us. And we talk about that a lot, and we should. And I talk about, I even talk about fear in the sense that unbelievers should fear God because of his wrath in hell. And, and that's true. But that's not what, really what this is talking about. If you look, this is talking about believers. This is talking about Christians fearing God. And I'll admit to you this morning that I'm guilty of not encouraging you guys to fear God. And obviously, before we, before we jump into this really, you know, this last part here, I want to encourage you that, that the fear of God for a Christian is very different than the fear of God for, for an unbeliever. An unbeliever who, who comes to the point where they understand that they're a sinner, that they're an enemy of God, there should be like this terror and this dread that, that they could end up in, in hell because they have rebelled against God. And, and as believers, we have the confidence and the assurance that, that Christ has died for us and, and that we have put our faith in Christ and that the Holy Spirit indwells us and that we are His and nothing can take us out of, our, out of His hands. So we have that assurance. I'm not talking about the same kind of fear that, that an unbeliever would experience. So what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean for awe to come upon every soul? And so I've got three things here kind of just talking to you this morning about the fear of God because I think the fear of God is something that's important. That, that we have this healthy respect, this healthy awe, this healthy, this healthy fear of God. It's like if you're in a room with a caged lion. You know that the cage is going to protect you and so you don't have this, this terror and this dread. And in the same sense, we know that God's mercy and God's grace is, 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 is with us and so there's not terror or dread or anything like that. But, but you'd be foolish to stand, cage or no cage, to stand right here with a lion right here and not feel a little kind of 
awe at the sense that there's something much bigger than me and much more powerful than me in the room with me. And that's kind of the same way it is with God, that we should have this kind of reverence that there's something much bigger and more powerful in this room with us than we are. So why should we fear God? We fear God, one, because of his nature. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 you, I, I don't think it's on the screen, but if you want to write that down, you can. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 says, You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and ca cannot look, up, look at wrong. God is of purer eyes. He does not see evil. He cannot even look at wrong. God will not tolerate sin. He does not even look on it. He fights against sin. And one day, he will ultimately destroy sin once and for all. But that also means that he will destroy those who persist in sin and in rebellion and in unbelief. I'm not talking about a believer who falls occasionally. I'm talking about those who refuse to choose Christ because they want to persist in their sin. God has no tolerance for sin. He won't even look at it. Second thing is we fear God because of our nature. Our, our, God's nature is that he is holy and righteous, doesn't even look upon sin. Our nature is that we are sinners. Right? Now, now, now those of us who have trusted in Christ, our nature is, is being changed. And we have been, in, in the Holy Spirit's been put in us and, and we, uh, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and leads us into righteousness. But we, all of us, at one point or another in our life, have sinned and have rebelled against God. And while we find comfort in the fact that we've been reconciled to God, there should also be some kind of healthy fear or reverence in our life about, about the fact that the universe is governed by a holy and powerful God and that we've rebelled against Him and that most of us in our life, we still persist from time to time in rebelling against Him. That thought should... You know, this, this isn't one of those, you know, we, we kind of have this, this idea in our culture today. It's like, oh, whoops, God will forgive me. No. Yes, God will forgive you. But there should be some kind of sorrow in my life. There should be this thought that, that my sin, what, what did my sin do to Jesus? My sin caused Jesus to go to that cross. And this kind of, this sense, this fear over, this thought should enter into our minds. What, what would God have done? over that sin had it not been for Jesus. That thought should enter into our hearts when we're tempted to sin. What, what would God have done to me over this sin had it not been for Jesus? If I thought like that every time I was tempted, I'd tell you what, I'd probably sin a lot less than I do. So we fear God because of his nature. We fear God because of our nature. We fear God because, because of his power. God does not owe us anything, but we owe him everything. And when we don't give him the worship and the righteousness that he is due, there should be this fear. Again, again, it's different kind of fear than an unbeliever experience. It's not this dread, it's not this terror, but there's this, this sense that God is holy and I'm offended him and, and he, he's powerful. And let me give you another example. The lion example is, is a good example. Another one, because I want to remind you that God is good. And we don't fear what will happen. We have confidence that we will not be treated as our sin deserve. If we, are, if we are Christians this morning, if we are trusting in Christ, we are not going to be treated as our sins, as our sins deserve for us to be treated. We are going to be treated with grace and with mercy. And so I don't want to, I don't want to, to lose that this morning. I want, I want you all to remember that this morning. We don't fear what's going to happen, but we fear what might have happened or we reverence, we have all respect for what might have, what might have happened had it not been for Jesus. Jesus. And it's like if I'm driving down a two-lane highway late at night and I fall asleep, right? And you've got you know, one lane going this way, one lane going that way, right? And I'll fall asleep and I cross over the center line and I wake up and I'm staring right down the barrel of an 18-wheeler, right? And at the last moment, I turn the wheel over, I get across the other lane and I get stopped on the side of the road and I'm okay. Swerve out of the way just in time. How am I feeling? As soon as I get that car stopped and I'm sitting there, how am I feeling? Relief. Scared. Relief comes in a few minutes, I think. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I'm scared. There's no danger. The truck's gone. I'm sitting on the side of the road. I'm not in any danger. I'm not scared of what is going to happen. I'm scared of what might have happened. And that's kind of how it works. And I don't want to really use the word scared because we don't, we don't have, like I said, we don't have this terror and this dread of God, but we have this awe and this respect for God. 
In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, it says, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that, cisterns that can hold no water. The thought here is that the cosmos is literally trembling with fear at what humanity has done against God. That is terrified of what God could do to us. Like the truck example, terrified of what could have happened. Not at what's going to happen. Because even though God is holy, and even though he is powerful, the Bible also says that he is good. The Bible says that if we confess our sin, he will forgive us. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is good news. God is holy. He cannot look upon sin. He is powerful. And he could literally tear the universe apart if he wanted to. He created it. He could tear it apart, no problem. But he is good. And everyone can be saved. If they'll believe. That's the hope of the gospel. And it changes everything. The hope that God didn't leave us in our sinful state, but he came. He died in our place. He rose again from the dead and he gives us the Holy Spirit. And yeah, he has demands on our life. He does. To live his way, to fight against sin, to press into him, to know him better, to love him more, to follow him more closely. But he doesn't just make those demands and then walk off and leave us on our own. He gives us the Holy Spirit to walk through that, this life with us, to convict us of our sin, to lead us into righteousness, to make us more like Jesus. So that's my encouragement to you this morning. I believe that if you know Jesus this morning, the Holy Spirit is working in your life. He is doing different things in all of our lives this morning. Some of you, he's encouraging. Some of you, he's bringing conviction. He's saying, hey, yeah, you haven't really walked in the fear of God. You haven't really, you haven't really, really, really tried to live a, a righteous life like I want you to. And then some of you, he's, 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 He's teaching you something. Some of you, he's teaching you something about community. And we're going to have an opportunity to respond in just a moment. But I want to leave you with this, that the Holy Spirit doesn't just make demands and then walk off and leave us on our own. He, he, he works with us. This is God's work. This is not our work. You're not saved by what you do or what you can do. We're saved what God is, by what God has done. That God has sent Jesus to go to the cross for us. That God has given us the Holy Spirit to help us, to convict us of our sin, to lead us into righteousness, not to leave us, not to make us feel guilty and then walk off. But to say, let me help you. Let me change your heart. Let me change your mind. Let me make you more like Jesus. So my encouragement to you this morning is to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Cooperate with him as he binds us together as his people cooperate as he works on us individually because ultimately it's really part of the same process. I mean, you can't have true biblical community unless you have people that are, that are, that are, that are being worked on and being made more righteous. It won't work, you know, unless we start, you know, having God work in our lives and make us more like Jesus. We're not going to get along like God wants us to do. And we can't have, really, we can't develop godly character uh, outside of the, the boundaries of, of biblical community. It's something that we can't do on our own. One of the biggest ways that God works in our lives and makes us more like Jesus is through each other. And so it's really, it's two sides of the same coin. So this morning I want to encourage you to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. To look to Him to gu for guidance. To allow Him to search your heart, to show you your sin. To convict you. To lead you into righteousness. To teach you to become more like Jesus. Cooperate with his work as he, as he binds you together with your heart together with the hearts of those believers around you. And as he just makes us into the people that he wants us to be. That's my encouragement for you this morning. And, and uh, let's, let's pray together. Let's, let's bow our heads.